Hi. I had some audio issues I was just fixing. Oh, you can uh, hear me? of course I can. Yeah. And nobody's frozen yet. <laughs> we are 10 seconds in. Yeah, exactly. And the only freezing part is me because somehow the upstairs, it's fall here now. It's fall here too. In Chicago, we, it was, I know it looked like Chicago. The airport said it was Chicago, but it was 72 degrees in October wow. in Chicago. That's, I brought a coat, I brought a scarf and never needed any of it there. Ah, sorry, it's cold in here. It's I cold. Brought, yes. I have my tea to keep me warm. Okay. Can I tell you about Chicago? Yeah, this is on top of the list is for you to debrief all about Chicago because I was following you on social media. So I know what happened in Chicago. And I woke up to a very funny text message from you with our trifecta, yes. <laughs> our little group that we have. And I was laughing. So I'll let you debrief about Chicago before we what did I send you a picture of the extravaganza. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you were in Chicago some reason on Saturday. So at the two day practicums, yes. so everybody in this practicum weekend, there's 20, there's supposed to be 30. There were 26 or 27 okay. and it all taken the core. And so we did the circle practicum in the morning where you find out who doesn't feel anything and who gets, oh my God, I can see colors. Talk about it for the people that don't know, because we have like people, it's a really cool part of the training, actually. Okay. The first practicum, I have a list of frequencies that almost everybody should have some response to at least one of them. Right. So I start with 40 on A, reduce inflammation, and 116 on B. And we have data on that. I love data. We have data on that in the mice, right. so people are big mice. So we, everybody holds hands and I should have one of those John Sharkey things. So yeah. we, everybody holds hands and we run the frequencies through everybody in the class. And over the last 15 years, 18 years that we've been doing that, it has become a complete bell-shaped curve absolutely every time 20 percent of the class doesn't feel anything at least not with 40 and 116 right some of that 20 percent it's they don't feel anything with anything right 20 percent gets so stoned they have to sit down or they just start giggling or they go dude right it's that's 20 percent and Everybody else, the 60% in the middle, is, I think I feel something, but I'm not sure what. So you pause the machine and you tell them there's whatever went away just now is what you were feeling. Because we are taught to interpret frequencies from birth, basically. Sound, mama. That's not a word. That isn't a word. It's a sound. Huh? Each. And you're taught that this flower or this bird is blue. Or mommy's eyes are blue. They're not blue. That's a frequency that is reflected off of a surface when every other frequency is absorbed. And the only thing that's reflected out is blue right not blue it's a frequency orchestra blah 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 so we have a way in our sensory cortex of interpreting those frequencies because we've been taught so we put everybody in a circle and we run 40 and 116 and it's like this frequency in our world reduces inflammation but your brain doesn't know what that feels like. Your joint capsule might, your pancreas might, but your brain doesn't have 
a feeling that goes with 40 and 116. So who in the group doesn't feel anything? And four people raised their hands. And I said, there are two of you that are afraid to be embarrassed. So where are the other two of you? Because out of 30 people, there's going to be Kevin creeping around the back. <laughs> oh, the lights. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh there's my face. You looked good. Look at anyway, you. there are. And th then the other two people fess up and raise their hand because it's always a straight up 20%. So that's the circle practicum. And then what we what I started doing about three, four weekends ago was we used to do the supine neck and shoulder, then the supine cervical because working on the neck with the patient supine always made me nervous because I had a bad experience one time where they did this on the front, they got distracted. Right, so now I've figured out that the supine cervical practicum is mechanically the easiest for everyone to do. And we do it three times. We have enough tables so that there are three people per table. One's a practitioner, one's a patient, and one of them operates the machine and looks at the slides. And there's one instructor for every two to three tables. And they're keeping an eye on, and I wander around and just tell everybody what to do, which is really fun for me. Anyway, so we've done the supine cervical practicum after, before lunch. Then we did it again after lunch. So now we've got two of the three that we need to do. And for some reason, I asked about Ehlers-Danlos. And after the break at lunchtime, I ran, I went through the Ehlers-Danlos webinar that I did. And it's frequencyspecific.com backslash webinars. And once again, first time ever, I says, is there anybody in the room that has Ehlers-Danlos? Because it, it's a slam dunk. And it, it'd be kind of fun if we did a practicum where we just treated the one or two elders down those patients. There were six of them. Tw what is six from 27 is 25% of the class. It's crazy. Had elders down those. And there was one patient from the outside who was being brought in by her practitioner who also had elders down those. So we had seven tables and it takes in a perfect world it takes three machines to treat an Ehlers Danlos patient one machine is running torn and broken in the connective tissue that chain literally somehow changes the length of the connective tissue don't know how it works never doesn't work they go from uh, those of you that know about Ehlers Danlos there's nine points so little finger pass at or past 90 degrees, elbow goes backwards three to 10 degrees, knees go backwards three to 10 degrees. They go backward to some amount, two, four, six. What's the eighth one? Elbow. Anyway, and then touch the floor with the flats of your hands, You're supposed to be nine. So two, four, six, I'm missing something. Anyway, so then the previous week, I'd found out that I had an Ehlers Danlos patient, 124 and 77, got her range of motion completely normal. They have stretchy skin, anyway, but, when we got a range of motion normal, her back pain increased right at T12 to about L3, like bad. And she couldn't touch the floor with her hands. That's the ninth, nine out of nine on the Baton score. And then it, I remembered that Ehlers Danlos patients also have a tendency to have tethered cord. Okay. So the cord is tethered at 
T12, someplace where the cord ends and the dura is tethered. So with one of our other Stanlos demos, once the range of motion was normal, once the little finger got to 70 degrees, then we switched from, oh yeah, one is on 124 and 77 for the connective tissue. One is on 40 and 10. The body pain diagram for Ehlers-Danlos lists the shoulders, elbows, hands, hips, knees, and feet as painful. And in the Ehlers-Danlos world, everybody thinks that's joints. In our world, that pain diagram is 40 and 10. Right. If you think about the disc annulus is made of connective tissue and Ehlers-Danlos connective tissue is stretchy and leaky. So the disc nucleus gets to leak out, irritate, demyelinate, interfere with the pain pathways in the spinal cord. So one machine runs torn and broken in the connective tissue. One machine runs 40 and 10 to get rid of the body pain. And one machine runs concussion in Vegas because universally with Ehlers-Danlos patients, their heart rates are elevated or irregular. They have POTS, which is a vagus dysfunction. They have digestive system problems and they have psychological issues, anxiety and depression, all of which are related to vagal nerve dysfunction. So you run a third machine, neck to abdomen and treat concussion in vagus or vagal tone. Anyway, and so we had seven tables. And during the practicum, were you just using one machine per table or you loaded them all up? We loaded them all up. Of you course you did. Do it. Right. We, we only had 10 precision cares. Practitioners brought, like local practitioners brought their own devices. We had six custom cares and everybody had 40 and 10 or concussion in Vegas on it. And we had enough to be able to do it all to everybody. And just saying to anybody who's a practitioner is listening, if you don't have 124 on A and 77 on B as your own one liner for your custom care, please put it on. Oh yeah. Ellers downloads or not, you're gonna have torn and broken in the connective tissue and why waste your precision care when you just need that running, the custom care? Yep. Okay, so the first of many rants I have today, continue. And this, is we started it at six, six o'clock. Because right. at the end of the day, we did supine cervical practicum and went to, anyway. And it, we went till 7.30 and all but one got up, pain-free, normal range of motion. Wow. One of the practitioners had a kind of Ehlers-Danlos that I haven't seen before. Ooh. It involved her digestive system. She was, I'll be fine. They did a surgery on her when she was seven years old because they told her that she was born without a lower esophageal sphincter or car cardiac, that's a good face, cardiac sphincter. And so they did that obnoxious surgery where they go up and they wrap the, that one. Yeah. And then they did that surgery again on her when she was in her, that's a good face, in her twenties. For those of you not watching the video, looks like we just killed her cat. Anyway, and her esophagus has been just like, they won't do another surgery on it. Her, she has a lot of difficulty with swallowing that has been helped by running increased secretions in the vagus. But with her, range of motion didn't go to normal. And that's a first. So any for practitioners that are listening, patients that are listening, especially practitioners, the first 20 or 30 of any new condition that you treat you, it's when I was doing fibromyalgia, for example, 
the first case report was 25. By the time I got to Bland Symposium, it was 48. By the time I got to close to 100 patients, I actually knew who it would work on, who it didn't, and why, and what else to include to make it work. This is the first Ehlers-Danlos patient ever that those three things, 124 and 77, reduce inflammation in the spinal cord, and concussion in Vegas. First patient ever, that wasn't sufficient. Hmm. Range of motion was still 90. And her esophagus has been described as paper thin. So she has one of the subtypes of Ehlers-Danlos that is more severe than what we usually treat. Most of what we treat is really either Ehlers-Danlos type one, the easy kind that's just musculoskeletal, or HST, hypermobility syndrome disorders. They're just, yeah. On the, um, we'll get back to her in a minute. For the patients, because we had them on the table and I wasn't about to sit anybody up, to treat the dura, we changed the um, 124 and 77, torn and broken and the connective tissue. Took the knee up towards the chest and on about 30%, so three tables, the knee stopped at 90 degrees. That means you've got adhesions in the cord and the dura. So we switched from 40 and 10 to 13 and 10, scarring in the dura. We switched to scarring, sorry, 13, scarring in the cord. Yeah. And we switched to scarring in the dura. So we were running scarring in the cord, scarring in the dura at the same time and just gently rock the knees up towards the chest and rotate it a little bit. And then the knee went to the chest, almost. Like, then they had normal range of motion. And that was it. Now, back to the esophagus lady. I had to go, it was Sunday. No, Saturday, anyway. It was Sunday when I found out about her esophagus. I just knew that she was the one patient that didn't work on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So Sunday night, I'm thinking, what would you do with an Ehlers-Danlos patient where it wasn't just 124 and 77? What would you do with somebody that had the specific kind of Ehlers-Danlos that affects the connective tissue and the digestive system and the arteries, 81 and 142, or 81 and 77. Right. With her, my suggestion was, or is, if she's listening, fund application, thank you. It's a, don't even get me started. So with her, if she's listening, because she and her husband are practitioners in Canada, I would run 124, and the esophagus, right? Inflammation and maybe increased secretions in the fascia or increased secretions in the connective tissue. Go. Before your brain explodes, it's- it'll... Okay, people don't understand how crazy it is when you bring up something and it's the same frequencies that I want to bring up, but in a different world. So what I wanted to talk about today was in increasing the secretions and the vitality, how those two work together, but they're different. And I'm using them with fascia, but also with adipose. Let that marinate for a minute. Wait, I have an objection. Yes. Could answer. Yes. The adipose secretes inflammatory cytokines. Why yes. would you do that? So I'm not using it in that way. However, just go with me down the rabbit hole for a second. Okay. When we're increasing the vitality. So I'm using this with 49. I haven't used it with 81 yet. Okay, good. Vitality makes sense. Yes. Yeah. I We don't need to increase 
the secretions in the fascia. But when we increase the secretions, with we don't need to increase the secretions to the adipose. But where I was going is there is a patient, and it's so funny that you mentioned supine increasing hip flexion to get the sacrum, the thoracolumbar fascia mobilized. So there's this give. It's always the dura. Yes. Or the cord. It, for sure. But when there's something left and you can feel it and it almost felt superficial, I'm thinking, what is it? What is this? And when adipose has adhesions, it's like a prickly so, sharp sort of feeling for patients. Three and 97. Adipose oh. versus it doesn't scars. Scar. Yes. Yes. Got it. Did it. There is still something left. So okay. I was thinking about this. We were talking about a couple of podcasts ago, the thixotropic changes, right? When fascia goes from hard to warm and jelly. And there was a study that they're doing with adipose or subcutaneous adipose and fascia having yeah. very similar properties that have exotropic changes to it. So, so sclerosis in the adipose did zip or did, did a little zip. bit, but not, didn't get it done. So I just did 49 and 97. And it got so warm and squishy. And the patient all of a sudden got completely stoned, closed her eyes and said, whatever you're doing, please don't press anything. Let it just go on that frequency. And this is a person that never felt anything, didn't feel smushed, never got stoned. And it was the craziest thing. So 49.97 did it. And, but it, that it is was so thick and cool. Yeah. And I was thinking about it. I use rock tape all the time or kinesio tape a lot. And the whole premise of how I took all my courses through kinesio tape is that the tape helps lift up the skin and the subcutaneous fascia to create space. Wow. And then when the space is there, that's when healing, circulation, all the stuff can happen. Is and so it? this is what I thought of with using 49 increasing the vitality to the fascia and the subcutaneous adipose. I don't know. I know what I felt. I know what I saw. It was objective. It's now, worth it. Now, an N of one. This is like the first time I ran 40 and 10. Right. And then the, for the practitioners listening, listening, the next step is to do it again. Right. And find out under which circumstances it works, right? Under which circumstances it makes it worse, right? Or under which cir circumstances in what patient that feels what way, right? It doesn't work, what right? Or is it reproducible in that type? So once you identify, this is so cool. This is, I love it. So under which circumstances in in what it what does it feel like when this is what you need right create an idea right you create a model right and you a hypothesis that's it and then you test the hypothesis okay in that patient that felt that way the thing that made this better was 49 and the adipose vitality in the adipose Will that work this time? Right. And then the harder part to me is at what point in the treatment do you do it? it? See, this is where I'm at. And with all the education I've received, we typically tend to use 89, 81 and 49, increase the secretions, increase the vitality towards the end, which makes sense because we need to, in my brain, I see it as like a snow plow. This is the Canadian me. We need to clear the way for certain frequencies to work. Or as Roger Billick would say, you take out the bad stuff and put in the good stuff. Exactly. However, I have, we, we are using 81 in the beginning with certain instances. We use 81 and 10 in the beginning when we know they're an 81 and 10 patient. We use 81 and I use 81 and 396. All the time in the beginning. So I, I, I that's a good point. Time. Yeah. For those of you listening, 81 and 10 is increasing descending inhibition in the spinal cord to increase theoretically the secretions of GABA 
to relax the muscles and you usually are aware of these type muscles in the legs. Correct. Strings, quads, pectineus and brevis especially. And especially when they, it is bilateral. Oh yeah, it's, yeah. And it, it's, once you feel tone, you can't ever not feel for it. Yeah. And then increased secretions in the nerve. Oh, I have to tell you about the other one, plain change. Increased secretions in the nerve is when you, the nerve is inflamed. Yes, it reduces the pain, but doesn't make the sensation normal. So right. there's still either hyperesthetic or numb, or it feels funny, or the muscle doesn't plump up. Right. That's then you increase secretions in the nerve. And don't you think it's especially, I know because a lot of people have written, wait a minute, I thought this was a total 4396. Now you're talking about 81. And I get it, it can be confusing because the nerve can be inflamed or scarred or need, or need increasing secretions. I found in my experience, this is just me, when 81 and 396 is indicated, it's almost like losing those last two pounds. Like you've got the nerve pain down, but it's still like a two and it still feels fuzzy. And right, it's just that last little bit. And then you're like, oh, it just, the nerve needs. And when you happen to have five machines in a treatment room, I start running True confessions. I run 40 and 396 and 81 and 396 at the same time. Yeah. And why wouldn't you? Because when you do that with the cord, I can't remember what condition you tried it out on at first when you ran 40 and 10 and 81 and 10 at the same time. And I went to work the very next day. I was like, I know what to do now. Yeah. Um, it was insanity how fast that worked. Now, speaking of nerve, and before we leave that topic, are you okay. ready? All right. Okay. So, phantom limb pain. Yes. Phantom limb pain. You amputate the leg, which means you cut the nerve, and then the patient has pain in the foot that isn't there. And we found out that the fix for that is to reduce inflammation or the activity of the thalamus. Because when you cut a nerve, the thalamus, which processes pain in the brain starts humming to itself. Mm. And that is thalamic pain. Yep. We run 40 and 89 and phantom limb pain goes away. Any of you that out there know anybody who has phantom limb pain, drag them in off the street, treat them, di document the case and send it to me because, all right, so there's that. The practitioner who was at the seminar, it's a family nurse practitioner who was in a side impact auto accident in 2019. So three years ago, maybe four. And she's walking with a cane. And I said, is that hip or knee? And she said, it's both. And then she pulled up on her phone photographs of how they repaired her pelvis. She was hit at high speed, side impact, broke both of her femur, femoral head, neck, and shattered her pelvis. Okay. Now, the good news is she's not dead. Good news is that they put her pelvis back together. The bad news is that they put a six inch two, six inch screws through the L4, five and S1 nerve roots and probably tagged L3 as well because she's got hyperactive sensation in the bladder which is, gets its sensation from L3. But four, five and S1. And she just mentioned in passing, she was gonna be the supine cervical supine lumbar patient and they're working on her and I said she said yes I have constant pain in my lower legs L4 5 and S1 okay so I had them run 
do supine lumbar to get rid of the scar tissue in her pelvis. And from the low back to her feet, they did 40 and 396. And she said, as I came by to check 10 minutes into the practicum, she said, it made the pain in my legs worse. And I went, do me a favor and switch to 40 and 89. Decrease the activity of the thalamus. If you put a screw through a nerve, you might as well cut it. Usually phantom limb pain takes 10 to 20 minutes to go from an eight to a zero. Took 15 seconds. And she said, the pain's gone. Wow. I said, really? She said, yeah. So they finished the practicum and I just, and we ran a custom care on concussion in Vegas and we let 40 and 89 run while Kevin took down the massage tables and she's laying there completely blissed out because it's the first time in three years that her pain has not been an eight. Now, just in case any of you are wondering about our, some of our colleagues, she was told by either a neurologist or an orthopedic surgeon that the pain in her legs, you, may, you should probably put your cup down, put it just, it'll be fine. The pain in her legs had nothing to do with the two screws that were put into her pelvis. Stop. Thank you. And they, because she was in her fifties, she's only 61, because she was in her fifties, instead of replacing her hips, which they should have done, they put basically 10 penny nails through them. Orthopedic screws, I'm sure under sterile conditions. Good news is they're all titanium, but yes. So if you have a patient who has a screw through a nerve, or who has a nerve that's been severed, the question you ask, and their pain level is a seven or an eight, and 40 and 396 makes it worse. Reduce inflammation in the nerve, increase secretions in the nerve doesn't work. Go to thalamic pain, phantom limb pain, and that's for cutaneous nerves as well. Mm, right. Yeah, so that was the other thing. And that was the other thing. I made her buy a custom care. She said, I'll buy one later. It's no. Right no, now. Because, and I will program it, because okay. if your pain comes back, I don't know how long this is going to last. If your pain comes back, she doesn't have devices. I need to know that you have some way of treating yourself. And this is Wednesday. We treated her Sunday and she is still out of pain. Has wow. After three days. Wow. So I still don't know what our time parameters are for phantom limb pain or flat, because what she has is phantom limb pain in three nerves. Yeah. Okay, good. Wow. Yeah, all those screws don't have anything to do with it. That hits me in the right here. How dare you say that to somebody? How is it that someone who's done dissection anatomy, who looks at the x-rays, can look at the x-rays, know the anatomy of the pelvis and the nervous system, and say, oh, those screws aren't doing anything. Excuse me? How does somebody with a 4.0 in biochemistry get to be that, I'm going to use the word ignorant. That's polite. Yeah, I'm being restrained. Just you. Oh. But the good news is she's got a life. She, yeah. she, because it's only been three years, she hasn't reduced her gabapentin yet. I forgot to set the out date when you use the 3.0 software. I oh, I know. The update has to be a required field. Yes. Elliot, if you're listening, Dan, somebody. It me. gets me every time because it's I'm not used to doing that yet. And it outdates the day you wrote it. Yes. Hello. 
So I know. I'm just put a sticky note on my little thingy. That's a good idea. It has so many great features, so, I, so we shouldn't really complain, but that is something I need to get better at. Let's get to some Q&A before we, we go any further down our rabbit hole. Cynthia says you brought the warm weather with you. Of course you did. You have a way of doing that. I wish. I'm back to Portland. It is now not 75 and sunny. It's now 54 and raining. So it's fall. Okay. Oh, I want to talk about this actually, Cynthia. That's funny. With the, prop with the proper frequencies, does a bulging disc actually return to normal with treatment and time? And exercises. Okay. So let's talk about this for a second. Okay. So I have had the month, you know how you get those months of it's the shoulder month or it's the knee month and you're seeing like everything this month for me, October has been low back pain due to disc bulging month, whatever. So I had a patient who came in and is very like anti-injection, anti anything. And he's like, those injections just mask the pain. And I'm like, I get what you're saying. And yes, you're right. But the whole point is not to just get an injection and be done. Just like coming here for a one hour treatment and then you're done. This is to get you out of pain so that you can move and the movement and the exercises it's, is what is going to help the disc. So sometimes the injections can be beneficial as long as they know. I know you see the failed ones and the things that go wrong. And it's like the number one yeah, the thing that you need to recognize is the risk, risks, yes, infection. The only thing worse than a bulging disc that makes your pain a six or a seven is an injection that goes sideways and you get a staph infection. Yes, they miss what they should be hitting and they stick a needle through the nerve. Yes, then that's doesn't go well. So yes, I have ordered probably more spinal injections than any chiropractor in the state of Oregon or any place in the country. And having dealt with the side effects, my recommendation actually starting in about 2000 was treat them for two to three weeks until you find out that is just, it's, we can't get it done. And usually it's with facets, but the problem now is you actually can't get a decent facet block. Mm -hmm. So I had a PM and R doc in the class in Phoenix last February. And I said, they, you can't get a decent facet block anymore. And he started nodding his head. And mm -hmm. I said, what is up with that? And he said, you've got anesthesiologists that become injection specialists. Mm. instead of physical medicine and rehab who actually know spinal anatomy and biomechanics what they do when they do a facet block now is they just block the medial branch that takes the pain away what they used to do in when Roy Slack was doing my injections for eight years he would actually get the c-arm in position put the needle into the facet joint inject die to demonstrate that he was there and not in an artery Mm -hmm. Then he would drop steroids and lidocaine into the joint, mm -hmm. knock out the inflammation, and the medial branch or the proprioceptive nerves on a facet joint, because of the inflammation and the cartilage inside the joint, there are neurotrophic factors that inveigle, invite the nerve into the joint, and the proprioceptive nerves change their character and become nociceptors. So getting into the joint, nobody does that anymore. Right. So, because insurance doesn't pay for it. So treat for two weeks. And the thing we did, the other thing we did at this weekend was I had time on Sunday to show the supine suboccipital activation exercises mm -hmm. yeah. and then the prone ones and then somebody said, what about the lumbars? This patient had L5, L4 discs on the right and an L1 disc bulge on the left. If you, when they lay prone, you have them keep their legs straight and 
think about lifting their leg and allow them to lift one quarter inch off the bed. And it should be hamstring, glute, ipsilateral, contralateral, multifidi. And if the ipsilateral, multifidi don't contract, then you have them lifted an eighth of an inch until you have a little, so the inhibition in the muscles is less. And the, you go, I go for the multifidi and the rotatories because they bring stability to the segment. Yes. Circulation to the segment. Yes. If you get them moving and they stand up, the big muscles, the QLs, the lats, all the big guys say, hey, you guys just stay inhibited. We got it. We can get them to walk. Right. Yeah, wrong. Then the disc stays that way. Sorry. No, that was perfect unpacking for what I wanted to add because the disc frequencies is only a small snippet in the disc rehab that you're doing. So yes, torn and broken in the annulus can drop pain down significantly. And when somebody is out of pain, they're more apt to move. But to your point, by the time they're coming to see you, their biomechanics are so messed up that you need to do that re-education after every treatment. And it's not this huge motor patterning. It's like what you just said, lying down and just getting the harmony back into those smaller stabilizing muscles, allowing them to fire, saying it's safe. You guys can actually fire. The person's not going to collapse. It's not going to cause pain. And they have homework. So laying yes. prone is comfortable for a disc patient. Yes. Yay. Unless yeah. they've got facets that are messed up anyway. So laying prone is comfy. Yeah. And they can feel, so I have them put their hand on the motifidae, feel what that muscle feels like. Right. Yes. So this patient got two reps. The third rep, motifidae is done. So we let him rest for a minute or two. Then he could get the third rep. I said, okay, you've got three reps in the morning, three reps at night, in bed, and then you can stand on the stairs with your good foot and the foot that is on the side that the disc is cranky. You take that foot and you put it into extension by about three or four inches and just let it swing. And you do that morning and night and I'll see you in three days. And then you double check, are you doing your exercises? And so if they have a custom care, it's easier, but somebody with a simple disc bulge and you've got room in your schedule to see them three times a week or two times a week, and they're doing their exercises at home. And actually, yes, I do have an N of one with pre and post FSM plus exercise rehab. Right. Five years apart. First one, L5S1 was skinny, dark, two millimeter or three millimeter bulge, no extrusions, just one degenerated crummy disc when I was in my 50s. Right. So we did lots of FSM. I did exercises at PT, blah, blah, blah. Five years later, when you would expect, that disc to be the same or worse. We did an MRI of my low back because I'd torn my SI joint and we needed to find out if it was, if at the same time I'd blown the L5 again. The L5 was thick, white, fluffy, unbulged. Wow. N of one. Right. But, but yeah, that's, let's answer Jane's question and then we'll move to the other ones and then we'll continue. Jane asks, do you think that thalamic pain frequency would help someone with congenitally fused L4, L5 and constant nerve pain in lower back? I've been using the other frequencies with temporary success. The individual now uses one of those other frequencies almost daily, but I've never tried thalamic pain frequencies. Here's the challenge with 40 and 89. The normal function of the thalamus is to suppress pain. Suppresses acute pain, but it can amplify chronic pain. I'm curious about what congenitally fused means. So then you have, 
if, what does that mean? So what are the pain generators? So if it's fused, there's no disc there or the facet joints are fused and the nerve pain is coming from foraminal stenosis in the low back? I would think what I have heard that it's, there's no disc born with it. Oh, facets are fused. I don't know. It's like, it says congenital, oh, facets are fused. Yeah. Then how do we know it's weight? If you have nerve pain, the pain is not going to be on the lower back. It's if it's L4 nerve root, it's going to be on the medial ankle mm. and the medial knee. If it's L5, it's pain in between the big toes. So the nerve pain is not in the lower back. It's going to be in the leg. That's nerve. That's where the nerves are. Yeah. So the question is. They have numbness in legs. Numbness in the legs. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, numbness. Numbness and pain, 40 and 89 is worth a try and 81 and 396. 81 and 396 is pretty likely to backfire because what's going to be causing the leg pain is, or the numbness in the legs is probably foraminal encroachment. Born with it, facets fused. Not firm feeling walking on the floor. What's the sensory exam like? Is it hypersensitive, numb? Walking on cotton, hyposensitive, so it's numb. Try 81 and 396 and 40 and 89. And then you're, it's like, you'll find out. It's, and you also might have to, if it's been that way since birth, there may be a disconnect between the sensory and motor cortex and the L4 nerve root. Does that make sense? Yeah. L5, actually. So L4 and L5, and that also means, and this is more in Kim's wheelhouse, L4 and L5 muscles are, if the sensation is compromised, that's a good word, is motor function compromised as well. Do you need Will 81 and 396 do anything to motor strength or coordination? So if you can get sensation normal, if you can get the pain down, normalize sensation, how much of the loss of sensation is due to the peripheral nerve and how much is because she was born with no connection between the L4-5 nerve root and her sensory cortex. And then it would be interesting to try 8192 and increase in the secretions of sensory motor cortex. So. Yeah. And then it's L5S1 on the same side. Yeah. The, from the advanced, follow the spark. Yeah. And I think I probably put it in the core. Yeah. Follow the spark down or up. And you won't know if it's centralized until you run 40 and 89. But I suspect you're right. Let's go over to the chat. I think there was a few comments or questions in the chat. It was slated for the fundoplication surgery. Autonomic neurologist said not to do it and increased. Okay. Where'd my chat go? Oh, Kevin. Delayed. Oh, no, it's me. I, yes, oh, I Autonomic neurologist said not to do it. Thank you. Oh. Increased secretions. It, it, uh, the increasing acetylcholine is secretions in the vagus yeah. and it's I, that that i can't I, that surgery is like no that's almost never mind the lady with the paper thin esophagus you might want to put your cup down again you know what they suggested i know let's take your esophagus out and pull your stomach up and then put you on proton pump inhibitors to so the stomach wasn't going to produce that's a good face and hey, was, you, know, you know how everybody right now is doing like a halloween special where everything is scary this is our scary halloween episode that's it's like insane and then somebody else fortunately said yeah we can't help you sorry great but then the thing that i asked her is why would they do that instead of removing what is that 
12, 10, 12, let's say 12 inch section of the small bowel, which does not produce stomach acid and just do a tran auto transplant. But I think 81 and 142 and 81 and 77 mm. and 40 in esophagus, treating her vagus has gotten her so that she can eat solid food, pureed food. Right. But deep breaths, adult beverages, continuing on the chat. Okay, good. We'll go to the chat. Would you use 4997 along with the kinesio tape? Yeah. I always use tape and frequencies at the same time. Somebody else, Kim, I have tape, but don't use it. Ah, I was thinking it's like muscle memory. I use wipe and reload. Yes. Gives me incredible results. Good. So much so my MS patient lifted her leg as a reset central nervous system was running. Yes. I'm learning how much our brain's messages are so important to our musculoskeletal. Yes, it all starts there. I just want to be in room with you guys talking about how much FSM is amazing. Me and why, let alone my clients, anyone in the UK to talk to. <laughs> um, there are practitioners in the UK. We just did a I mean, there's some really lovely people over there. The, and the thing that makes FSM practitioners different is nobody else thinks of it because they don't have a tool that lets them manipulate it. So the medical physician that thought about giving the patient the drug that reactivated the esophageal sphincter, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't know who DNA is, but spot on, hydrochloride caused the sphincter to work where the proton pump inhibitors deactivated it, yet the gastroenterologist did not know that the sphincters were activated by low pH, meaning the GERD should be treated with acid. So, hi, Dana. Yeah, what is up with that? Wow. I, so I, if somebody can figure out a way to find a neuro neurologist and a gastroenterologist, pardon my French, that aren't idiots. I would like, who, ha okay, I'm fine now. Everybody's okay. And then Jane piped in one more question here, really quick or comment, by the way, different client that I've asked about before. Finally, she no longer tenses up with 81 on the Vegas. Oh, I remember that story that she was yeah, talking about. Vegas increases acetylcholine. And for those of us with stiff person syndrome, yeah. So on that patient, you had to do 81 and 10 and 81 in the Vegas at the same time. Yeah. Because 81 and 10 increases GABA, which relaxes the muscles. And the GABA, will do more than the acetylcholine. Is that, nope, lost you. Yes. 81 and 10 reduces tone. Yes. Ooh, thank you, Dana. What did Dana say? Neurologist couldn't address the vagus, had to wait 10 months for the autonomic neurologist. Thank you, God, there are such a thing. Who, by the way, is, oh, no, go back to the questions, Kevin. Oh, sorry, that's me. Hang on. Oh. Hang on, go there. Who Click on answered? Answered. Okay. Yeah. And then scroll down. All right. Okay. So, GABA. So, when I, I talked to Jay Shaw last night, he's coming on Saturday at the symposium, and he's going to do 60 to 90 minutes, and he might bring his wife. I'm so excited. You get to meet <laughs> Anna if we're really lucky. He was there last year when we ran 81 and 10 on David Murphy. Oh yeah. Increased tone, hyperactive reflexes. We ran 81 and 10. And the only neurotransmitter that would do that is GABA. GABA is the neurotransmitter that relaxes. Okay. And for reasons I don't understand, 81 and 10 does not increase acetylcholine. So I don't get that. 40 and 10 relaxes muscles too. I don't get that either, but we know for sure that 81 and 10 decreases tone, which means it increases GABA. When you're running 
increased secretions in the vagus operates on acetylcholine. So when you increase secretions in the vagus, apparently you are also, which I didn't know, increasing secretions, circulating secretions of acetylcholine or circulating levels of acetylcholine. Okay. And this patient had acetylcholine antibodies causing her to contract. If you had acetylcholine antibodies, wouldn't that interfere with? I don't get it. Wouldn't that interfere with the ability of acetylcholine to cause musculoskeletal contraction? Was she, did she have MS? Oh. What was her, what were the, what's that one with acetylcholine antibodies? Great, not Graves, the other one out there remembers. It's four o'clock. My yeah. brain is like. Myasthenia gravis, thank you. That was just on the tip of my tongue. Okay, acetylcholine antibodies, myasthenia gravis. And the thing with myasthenia gravis is that the characteristic of it is muscle weakness. Yeah. I don't know. There, isn't FSM good for humility? It's, there comes a point in every weekend or every five day where I say out loud, you guys understand that we are engaged in clinical research. The frequencies always do what they're alleged to do. And you actually, when you ask me questions like that, the answer is, I have no idea. And they go, huh? Right. Like, so you find out by treating it. Right. And then there you go. And we're so lucky that we have this community that we can ask questions to. I had a practitioner reach out and says, I feel so stupid sometimes. And I'm like, no, because there is no reason you would ever need to know any of this stuff in your normal practice. When anybody's normal practice. Right. <laughs> Exactly. And we all have our gifts. We all have our strengths. So I love getting questions from MDs about MSK stuff because they don't need to know that stuff as long as they don't mind when I'm asking them things. What do we have? Something else coming in. Oh, it's Dana. Again, okay. it's she, she was prescribed. The patient was prescribed myosina gravis and she was prescribed acetylcholinesterase inhibitors for myosina gravis. It wasn't genuine myosina gravis but a vagus nerve dysautonomia. But yeah, and testing for acetylcholine antibodies or what you call it, the um, antibodies I've got to the GABA receptors in my muscles is really tricky because the medical ELISA tests didn't pick it up, but NeuroZoom did. And yeah, there's that. You <laughs> seen Jane's message, but this is like being in Nirvana. <laughs> <laughs> Due to this level of critical thinking. Yes, Jane, I concur. <laughs> That's awesome. FSM is not, it's, yeah, it is, it is, there's the percentage of practitioners that are willing and able, two different categories, willing and able to learn FSM as a language and then use the frequencies as a way of learning about the connections between the nervous system, the musculoskeletal system, the difference between weakness and muscle inhibition, the difference between, yeah, it, the percentage is improving. Yeah. It, compared to 20 years ago, I don't have to do even 10 years ago. I don't even do a demo during the practicums anymore because 10 years ago, people came in and they were skeptical. So prove it to me. And now they've heard the podcast, they've read the book, they've watched the webinars, they've done this, they've done that. So they arrive already sold and they already know it works. And so we just done, yeah, it's so much fun. We have to wrap things up, unfortunately. No. We're already over. So speaking of symposiums and all those things, if you are 
dragging your heels, I would register for all the stuff in February now because things are getting booked up. The FSM Sports Early Bird Special ends November 1st. So get on that one. Your early bird ends at the end of the year. But these are great Christmas presents. So give somebody the gift of education and sign somebody up for a course. I have a fabulous quote I have to end things with. It's a bit, it's a big one. So you have to listen. Okay. I'm listening. Okay. At the end, what really matters is not what we bought, but what we built. It's not what we got, but what we shared. It is not our competence, but our character and not our success, but our significance. Oh, isn't, doesn't that just fill you up? And I feel like that's what this hour is all about. It's sharing and building and it's not a proprietary secret sauce. This is all about collaboration. And I'm just so grateful for everybody and all of this stuff. And it's about being thoughtful and caring yeah. and putting it together. And that's what you said. Yay. I love it. I love it. And I love you. And I love everybody listening. So I love you too. <laughs> Have a great week. You guys too. This was a lot. This is a lot to chew and I'm going to have to listen to this back. So have a great week, everybody. <laughs> Bye. See you next Wednesday. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinions provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.